Man, I can just imagine the grade school making fun of all that that uh, people would do. Um, so we want to look today at how do we know God is faithful. Uh, we've talked about some of the different facets of it. Uh, how do we know that God, and I asked the question online, how do we know that God is faithful? Um, so how do we know? The preacher said so. Facebook memes say so. Some book that I read says so. For my life is so blessed and I have no trouble at all. That's why. Some Christian superstar set up when they won a game. They got a microphone in front of them. How do we know that God is faithful? I'll let you answer that. We've got a couple answers online. That's about it. So how do you know that God is faithful? Personal experience, that's one of the things I wrote down, yeah. Uh, my experience confirms it. The one online was, uh, that McKenna's boyfriend said, and uh, also another, uh, that the Bible says it. Uh, Jess's mom, I couldn't pour a name out of my head. Uh, <laughs> Jan, yes. Uh, because God's word says it. Um, so we have God's word says it. My my own experience says it. Uh, what else? In every sunrise, every sunrise creation says it. Uh, the the uh, eclipse should say it. Uh, that God is faithful, but also the testimony of others uh, will show you that God is faithful. If you see this movie. It's, it's in Indiana. I didn't mention, get to mention that. It is in Indiana, so that's why I had, had brought that. So you, can, you don't have to go anyplace else to see it. Um, unless you want a fancy movie house, then you may have to go someplace else. But it is in Indiana. Um, God said himself he is faithful. Yes, God says himself he is faithful. That, that's the other one. God says himself, he says he's faithful. But it's also the testimony of others, and it's the cross. Because God said it in the very beginning to the serpent, I promise you, the seed of the woman is coming. And you may strike his heel, but he will crush your head. The cross. The cross is probably the biggest, biggest example of God's faithfulness. Um, so we want to look at some uh, testimonies of others as well as the scriptures. And I, and I thought as I was doing that, I didn't leave the scripture on the screen, so I'm going to go through one, one thing at a time and you can see the scripture yourself um, and be able, to, uh, be able to read it there. Heavenly Father, we pray your spirit, Lord, would help us as we dive into the difficult and wonderful truths about your faithfulness. It's easy to say. It's much harder to understand. Give us your spirit and your guide as you direct us, Lord, that we may look into uh, your word to understand how faithful you are. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> the first one I want to look at is God is faithful to forgive and pardon. We talked about standing on the promises. And we, we, we say I'm standing on the promises. Well, my question is, which promise? Oh, just the promises. Which one? I mean, because you can't just stand on them generally. I'm standing on the promises. Well, what, what, what's promised? I don't know. Whatever God promised. How many promises are there in the Bible? Hundreds? Uh, it depends on who, who's counting. Uh, somewhere between 3,000. Someone says 8,000. Somebody else says 30,000. That's probably a little extreme. Uh, I don't know what they're counting as promises, but at least... Three to eight thousand uh, promises in the Bible, but like when I when I sinned and, and I need forgiveness, what do I? What? How do I know God's going to forgive me? How do I know? Because He says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now I have memorized that, I have quoted that, I have used that for years, but I didn't really get it about the pardoning abundantly until this week when I came across this verse Isaiah 55 7 but again I know but never connected it together uh, and in Isaiah 55 7 
It says, let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will, he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Let me confess my struggle. I'm reluctant to forgive people who are leaders who sin greatly and make God look bad, I guess, if you will. Uh, but as I, as I thought about how right I am in this, God reminded me that I'm a reluctant forgiver, not to people who've hurt me, but to people who have hurt the body of Christ and hurt others. Uh, like David and Bathsheba, David didn't sin against me. Um, he sinned against somebody else. Well, I had trouble with him because he killed somebody, took their wife, asked for forgiveness, and he gets to keep the wife. And the guy's still dead. And then God would say their child is going to be the next king. And I'm like, no, there's lots of other people that can be king. A lot of these other children, not this one. But it said God loved Solomon. God abundantly pardons. I, as God told me, reluctantly pardon. What's the difference? He reminded me of the prodigal son. And asked me, what if you were the father? And then he showed me what I would do. I would say, you can come back home, but you're not getting a ring, and you're not getting a robe, and you're not getting a party, and we're not killing a fatted cat. You're not getting your room back. We've already used that for something else. And you can come back, and you can live with the servants, and when you prove that you're really sorry, then you can have the family ring back in the room. See, that's how I would pardon them. I, I, I would reluctantly pardon if I was the father. I would say, you're not getting your inheritance back, you already spent it all. Just because you ran out of money, don't mean you can come back home and get some more. We had a saying, once a prodigal, always a prodigal, I'm suspicious, it may leave again. You can earn back the family road. You can earn back the family ring if I see that you really repented. But see, that's not how God did it. Amen. It, it, it says, he didn't reluctantly pardon. It says he abundantly pardoned, over the top, extravagant. Did this this kid just said, "Father, I'm sorry. You know, I'm not willing to. I'm not not worthy to be your son." He don't even listen. He already said, "I'm gonna kill the fatted calf. I'm gonna party. Everything is abundant. Here, I'll give the family ring back." And God was showing me that's not how you do it. It's reluctance. If you, if you prove to me that you're really sorry. But God abundantly pardons. He's faithful not just to reluctantly, but sometimes we think that because people do. Maybe because we do. And we think God's like that. Okay, I guess I'll let you come back. But it's never going to be as good as it was before. Amen. No, God abundantly abundantly pardons. Like he says, abundant life he's going to have, uh, that he's going to give us. So God not only pardons, he abundantly pardons. And that's a promise you can stand on. When we, we feel like, we still feel bad after we've confessed, and I've asked God to forgive me. Has he forgiven me? I don't know. I still feel bad. Standing on the promise says, God, you said in your word that if I would return to you, you would abundantly pardon. You would have mercy on me. You would abund I'm standing on that promise. Not all the promises, that promise. If I confess, you'll forgive. You will abundantly pardon. Because you're faithful. Not because I promise I'll never do it again. Not because I'm sorry enough. But because you promised. That's the difference. We're looking to him. Too often I was looking at my own self thinking, I gotta be sorry enough. Number two, God is faithful to strengthen us and protect us. 
where he says in 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one, or some translations say from evil. He will strengthen us. He will protect us. Don Hinkle uh, was my uncle who's passed away, but this is another Don Hinkle who was a political commentator of all things and journalist. And he lost his wife Bernadette to a brain tumor. And in the years that's passed, he's coped by leaning on this one scripture here, but God is faithful who will strengthen you. Leaning on that promise. And, and he wrote a, a column that said, my personal testimony of God's faithfulness. And he mentioned two examples. The first one had to do with Bernadette's wedding ring. A few weeks before the tumor was discovered, she was in the living room playing with the dog, and he noticed, you don't have your wedding ring on. He said, where's your wedding ring? And then the phone rings, and she goes to get the phone, and he never gets the answer. And then three weeks later, she passes away. And so he doesn't know where it's at, so he looks and looks, and I look high and low and everything. I looked for 10 months and couldn't find her wedding ring. And then I look in the dresser, or the, the nightstand, and in one of the drawers, her ring was there, where she had probably got... Her fingers were swelling, and so she put it there. And he said, God used that to remind me of how he had brought us together and that he was faithful. And the second had to do with Bernadette's Bible. He says, over a year, Don didn't touch it. He just could, couldn't bring himself to it. And finally, after a year, he says, God gave him the strength to pick up her Bible and look at it. And as he did, he said he noticed there were, was a, a, something from a service that he had done, and and how he said it began to look at all the notes and the scriptures she had written there to him and written in her Bible brought strength to him and gave him blessing to realize how that God had been gracious and faithful to him. He said, I rest in that scripture, Second Thessalonians, that the Lord is faithful to strengthen you. And if we look, he says, if we're looking, We'll find ongoing tokens of God's faithfulness in ways that seem small, yet significant to our hearts. And so when you look at the things that, that he's talking about, they don't seem like great big things. Her reign, her, her Bible don't seem like big to us. But to him, they were small tokens of God's faithfulness who had brought him through the loss of his, his wife. If we're looking you'll find ongoing tokens of God's faithfulness. Are you looking? Number three, God will prove himself faithful. We've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, and hopefully we'll get it. He's never failed me yet. The song says, he's never failed me yet. I have proven him true. Like Connie said, personal experience, I have proven him true. What he says he will do. I love this, this verse. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your word is settled. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Why? Because his word is settled in heaven. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. It's settled in heaven. Amen. And so that's what we can stand upon the promises because in heaven it's settled. You establish the earth and it abides. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Endures. Marie Monson's a Norwegian missionary in China, and she wrote the true story, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And she told about being in China when the, an army was, was coming through their town. They knew they were killing everybody, killing men, women, and children, and they were going to be in her town the next day. And so she says, That night when I went to bed, I began to pray the promises of God, of his protection. He will take care of us. And she said, I stood upon the cross and I went to sleep unafraid. The next day, she said, we gathered them as they knew the army was coming, the bandits, the soldiers were coming, and so she gathered a tiny little group together and, and uh, were waiting. And pretty soon she heard, as a, the butt of a gun was hitting against the door, and so she went and opened it up. There was one soldier there, and she let him in, and he just kind of looked around and what are you people just standing here for? You don't look afraid or anything. And well, What are you people doing here, he said. 
And so they told him about Jesus who comes to give peace and life eternal. And he had never heard of Jesus before. And she said, do you want some tea? And he said, yes. He said, are you hungry? Yes. And so she, they gave him some food and they shared about Jesus and said he was impacted by it, even though he had never heard it before. So before long, he just slipped out. He was gone. And she said, the next day, all the soldiers were gone too and nobody ever bothered them again. And she went back to this thing, your word, O oh Lord, is settled in heaven. She said they, they left the town behind in a little group that believed the word of God. They believed the word of God, that God is faithful to his promises and all who put their trust in him. And we look at those stories and we love those because we get the answer we want. And we always say God is faithful when we get what we want. But as I thought about Acts chapter 12, and it's one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible where James is beheaded. And then we get the story of Peter being delivered. And so when James was beheaded, did they say God wasn't faithful? Because he didn't protect James? God was faithful when he protected Peter and got him out of prison with an angel. Was he not faithful to James who gave him grace to die and become the first martyr of the church? Absolutely. But in our mind, it's he's faithful if I get what I want. Then he's faithful. But God's faithful even in dark times when things are not easy and not good. And the song we sang is when peace like a river attendeth our way. That's wonderful. And then the second verse isn't the same. When sorrows like sea billows roll. That's two different times. One's when things are great and the other's when things aren't. But God's still faithful even in dark times. In dark times. Go to the next one there, Dave. Um, in dark times, he's able to, to be there with us. He doesn't turn back on us. He doesn't give up. Zechariah has the scripture there that God is speaking into a discouraged people. Part of the people haven't come back yet from captivity. And the ones that have come back are discouraged and they're oppressed by the people and, and they're looking down. And, and this is when Zechariah says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem, and they will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. As Chris says, God himself says, I will be faithful to them as their God. And I have the story of, of uh, Pastor Robert Morgan. And he's, if any of you journal, the thing about journaling, you can look back and see what your mindset was some time ago. And he said, I was going through some of my old journals, and I look back into uh, December 9th, 1986, and he said, I, I'm looking at what I wrote, and he said, I was sitting there looking at the Christmas tree. He must have got it up early. And trying to fend off the worry and fear that robbed me of sleep at 4.30 in the morning. So said, across the parking lot was our new church building, unfinished and further delayed. After seven years here, I felt tired. We pushed hard, tripled our attendance, conducted a beautiful building, but now there are many feelings and emotions in me, most of them not good. Resentment, hurt, disappointment, fear, and finally a sense of failure. I should have done more. We should have done more than we did. And then he said he began to pray. This is, this is all written in his journal back in 1986. <clears throat> oh Lord, you are the one who will never leave us or forsake us. He's praying the promises of God. You have loved me with an everlasting love. Again, another promise of God. Please stoop and help deliver your poor, sin-ridden, helpless, little faith servant. Listen, I'm going to lay out this, this letter like um, King Hezekiah did, the letter of Sennacherib, and say, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. And then he says, that was 36 years ago. And he said, I'm seeing now how that God used the pressures to teach me to pray and persevere and learn to regulate my attitudes and emotions by the Holy Spirit. And I got the picture of sometimes we're looking at the problem from the front side, like it was in 1986. And the problem looked like I'm a failure. <coughs> this building is still not finished. And we're in all these difficulties. I have fear and worry and discouragement. And I just want to quit and leave. That's the front side of the problem. <coughs> But then 36 years later, he looks at the backside of the problem and says, God brought me through this. I know what God was doing. And, 
And God is faithful. You see, I doubt if Joseph said God is faithful when his brother sold him into slavery. I doubt if he said God is so faithful when he got lied about and put in prison. And he quite get up every morning for 13 years said God is faithful for letting me be in prison for a crime I didn't commit. But when Pharaoh had his dreams and the famine hit, and his family had food, which they were starved to death. Then Joseph said, looking at the back of the problem, God is faithful. And so many times looking at the front of the problem like Joseph, why, oh God, why have my brother sold me? Why am I being charged with something I didn't do? We're looking at the front of the problem. But it's when we look at the back of the problem, oftentimes we see God's faithfulness. Because at the time we think, I, where are you at? God, you're not doing anything. As I was a young Christian, I thought, when I prayed, God had to do it the way I told him to. That's the way I thought it. And if he didn't, he, he failed. But over time, I began to realize that God is infinite. He has a million ways to answer his prayer. Not just my little puny way. Mm -hmm. And so, he may want to do it a different way. And he's good enough, and I can trust him to do it, even when it doesn't make sense to me. Even in the dark times, God shelters us by his faithful promises. He shelters us. Let's look at number five. In Psalms 91 that we have as your memory verse, hope you memorize it. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall find refuge. And the New Living Bible says, New Living Translation, his faithful promises will be your shield and rampart. Or be your armor, I guess, your armor and your protection. The, the other translation said that. One translation says your faithfulness, and the other one says your faithful promises, again, that flow out of your faithfulness, will be our protection. Sheila Walsh uh, talked about in her book, The Shower of God's Promises. She got a letter in the mailbox from a lady who had wrote about her struggle. She said, I had illness, I had financial hardship, and then my marriage broke up. And she said, I would not have made it this far without the promises of God. Without the promises of God. And so Sheila Walsh said, I began to look at the promises of God, begin to study myself on what are the promises. And, and, and her own study realized that there is shelter, shelter in God's promises. She said, God not only keeps his promises, he longs to keep them. And she asked this question. Why would God keep his promises to us when we mess up so bad? <clears throat> why would he want to keep his why would he want to keep his promises? And here's what she said. The Bible reminds us of a truth that shines as clear as the sunlight because God can't help himself. His faithfulness, who he is, his character, he has to keep the promise. He wants, even if we fail, he says, even if we are faithless in the New Testament, God has to remain faithful. He can't be anything else. He longs to keep his promises because of who he is, not how good you're doing. See, we depend upon ourselves and, and our things more than what God is doing. We talk about and I, I'm not going to have time. I want to go through some of these tonight, probably. God has faithfully arranged the details of our life. That is numbers. Yeah. We won't get a chance to go over that tonight. The next one as well, where he talks about God's faithfulness is our hiding place. And Rodney had pulled this out this morning. You are my hiding place. You remember as a kid when you had a hiding place? You would go there and, and you were saved because you were in your hiding place. The psalmist says, you shall preserve me <clears throat> from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. God's faithfulness is our hiding place. But let me close with this last one, number eight. Failure is never final because God is faithful. He says in Isaiah 55, my word shall not return to me void. Why? Because God is faithful. It shall accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing I send it. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Why? 
because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And in Galatians 6 it says, Let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time we shall reap a harvest if we don't give up. I had uh, a couple situations because of a, I, I, I felt convicted that I wasn't wearing God's name like I should. It's easy to wear it in here because everybody's kind of for you. But what about when you're out there when many people can't stand Jesus or want anything to do with it? And, and if I wear his name, if I wear something that displays that I'm his, then they might not like me. And to be honest, it was just easier not to let people know. It, but then I, I realized that I don't, this is not what I should be doing, and so I went online and went to China and ordered some t-shirts. <laughs> and uh, the only problem is, remember, the sizes aren't the same. So I got three t-shirts that spoke about <laughs> Jesus that I could wear. I thought, I'll give them 2X, that will be plenty good. I think they're like a medium. Uh, <laughs> Chinese sizes aren't the same. <clears throat> but I tell you that, tell you this, I went to that track meet last, yesterday, and I thought, I'm going to wear this shirt, and somebody might not like me, they might punch me in the face. I don't know what they're going to do. It doesn't matter. But I have to wear Jesus' name. And so it says, Jesus saved my life. That's what it says. Jesus saved my life. And I had an older guy come up to me that I don't know, don't have any idea. There's like six schools there, I think. And uh, he said, he saved mine too. And I said, that's great. And he said, uh, I used to love beer. He said, a lot. And he said, I quit 31 years ago. And he said, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be here today. And, and I'm thinking, this guy's telling me this, and, and all I did was wear a t-shirt. And I said, amen, you know, that, that's great. And, and uh, so this total stranger walks up and says that. And uh, God says, my word will not return void. Our witness will not return void. And sometimes we think, well, it's not going any good. We want to give up. We want to quit. Uh, speaking to this person hasn't helped. Uh, and my daughter got me a, a t-shirt that says, I am forgiven. I try not to get anything that's political or anything like that. I want only that, that tells Jesus in a positive way. And I wore it down to size this week. And uh, an older lady who works there who's a cook or something. She said, I am too. And I have to think a second. Like, well, I forget what I'm wearing. <laughs> and then I said, oh, oh, great. You know, but that's the problem. You have to remember what you're wearing when you do that. Uh, but... But his word will not return void. We will not be in vain what we do. If we witness, we say a word. And as, as I've said to Tammy, her and Anna Pearl, I've sown seed into young people that are going back to their country. And we may not see the harvest, but we just sow the seed and trust God that his word will not return void. Why? Because he's faithful. Amen. Failure is never final because God is faithful. It may seem like it, but it's not because God is faithful. We can trust him to be faithful because he can't be anything else. That's who he is. Let's all stand this morning. Rodney's got a song that we want to close with uh, to remind us of that thing, that, that, that God is faithful and then we're going to pray. I hope we get it. I've only preached one sermon on faith once in about 40 years, and I preached three in the last week, and so hopefully it got to get through my head. The scripture, Psalms 30 through 7, leads us into this song You are my hiding place. <laughs>
Sometimes we just want him to remove all the bad stuff, and sometimes he just parts it and makes a way through for us. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to take it home with your people. May we trust you, Lord, even in the difficulties of life. We know that you're faithful to be with us, and you will deliver us out of all the difficulty that life brings our way. We trust you because you're faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yeah, 